First Timothy chapter five this morning. And this is all about prioritizing those who are in need. You know, taking care of another person can be both incredibly draining and also amazingly rewarding. Every mother in this room knows this. <laughs> But Jesus wants more than just mothers to know this. He wants all of the people made in his image to know this. And he wants all of the people made in his image to experience this and to put it into practice. See, caring for one another is founded and grounded on a life-altering love relationship with Christ. John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35 tells us, this is Jesus speaking. He says, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, so that you will love one another. And by this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. This three times in one little paragraph, he says, love one another. I think there's an emphasis there for a reason. God's word tells us if we do not love one another, then the truth does not abide in us. It doesn't live in us. I was thinking uh, just this week, about some of the natural disasters recently, uh, natural disasters in air quotes, um, if any of you are conspiracy theories, uh, theorists. Um, some of the natural disasters that have happened in, in before Hurricane Helene, the hills and the hollers of South Tennessee and the Carolinas were an incredibly beautiful place to go and to drive through and to visit. And I've been there many times. And I was overwhelmed by the sheer ferocity of the storm that killed 98 people in North Carolina Carolina alone and left many others missing and presumed dead. And as I was watching snippets on the news and online and on social media, I started to see right after the the hurricane had passed through, I started to see uh, some familiar faces from my home state on the news and a few others that I saw online giving their time, uh, their energy, their money, their resources to help those who are afflicted. It made me proud to have friends like that. Long before FEMA ever arrived, many people from all over the Southeast and, and many more from all around our country descended on that place to work, to rescue people, to rescue animals, to rescue property. And the reason that I bring this up this morning is because before any of that went down, my hope for humanity was waning. I look at the world around us. I just look at our nation. And my, my, uh, my hope was, was at an all-time low. When we look at the world today, we see wars and rumors of wars. I, I believe just in the last 48 hours that we have likely seen, uh, I think, the beginning of what will be remembered as the start of World War III, as Israel... Uh, went after Iran, as they should. And we see an increasingly complex landscape concerning concerns people have about the environment. We see the push for DEI. If you don't know what DEI is, it's diversity, equity, inclusion, whatever that is. Um, and, and, and a deep divide in our population. And I know there are still some good people on this big blue ball. <laughs> and I know that because The rapture of the church hasn't happened yet. So while we're still here, Jesus wants us to serve one another. And in his economy, God calls us to prioritize those who are in need. And so as we look this morning at 1 Timothy chapter 5, we're going to see a really strong emphasis on prioritizing those who are truly in need and not just enabling those who are lazy. And the main point is to prioritize those who are legitimately needing help and to treat everyone with respect, regardless of age, gender, or status. 
And this chapter includes instructions on how to care for widows, how to discipline elders, how to treat people in God's image. It's a good reminder for us that the local church isn't just about the worship of Jesus, the singing, the gathering like we're doing right now. And it's not even about the joy of being together, although those are wonderful things. But the purpose of the local church is to care for one another. And with that, is, with, with that in mind, uh, let's look at the text here in 1 Timothy 5, starting in verses 1 and 2. Paul writes, Do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father. Younger men, like brothers. Older women, as mothers. Younger women, as sisters. And in all purity. Let your, let your heart's intent be pure if you have to rebuke someone, have to correct someone. He says, don't rebuke an older man, especially in public. Why? Okay, well, to, to, to do so would be to dishonor him before others. There is a way to gently address things, issues, especially with those who've been in the faith for a very long time. And we need to, we need to acknowledge that. But you need to encourage him as you would a father with gentleness. So the word says to treat that man with respect and honor, even if you're the pastor, even if you're the lead guy, you treat them with honor. So basically what he's saying is there's no exception to this, right? And, and then we're told here in the text to encourage younger men as brothers. And I love that. That word encourage, it, it literally means to put courage into one another. Get that courage in them. Get, get, them, get them ready to go, right? We're, we're, we're pressing on to the upward call in Christ Jesus. And, and I've got to add, I'm, I'm so glad, I'm so glad that our men's ministry is going monthly rather than just quarterly. Yesterday's breakfast was... Uh, it, it was in the, what was once the arcade, obviously, and, and it was so encouraging to my heart and so challenging in our time together. It was awesome. And I love that. I love that we're doing a monthly thing now with that. And if, if you didn't already know, we're on a three-month cycle. We, we meet for prayer and catching up with one another and in months one and two. And then every third month is a large gathering with a speaker giving a message for worship. So if you're, you guys, if you're not involved in men's ministry, um, you need to get involved. It's, it's a monthly thing now. And, and we just want to be able to pray for one another, to bear one another's burdens, to lift each other up. And so I'm, I'm excited for that. We are, we are told here in the text, we're to encourage older women as mothers. So stop and think about that for a moment. Think about the older women that you love, respect, and cherish. How would you speak to them? If you had to correct them, how would you approach that situation? How would you speak and treat your own mother? I think that's a pretty good guide for us to utilize in the church, unless you're used to screaming at your mother, in which case you need to repent. But we need to just, we need to think these things through, right? The word also tells us to encourage younger women as sisters. And we had this mantra in our house when the kids were growing up. And it, the mantra was, boys protect girls always. Boys protect girls always. That was, and, and we didn't have that rule until we had a, a little girl. <laughs> we had two boys who were just, just going at it, you know, rough and tumble and and then we had this, this beautiful little baby girl. And then suddenly we had this new perspective, right? And that was the rule when Abby was born and her brothers watched her like a hawk. I know I've told this story, but maybe some of you haven't heard it. Um, my, my um, uh, I guess it was actually it was Jen's parents had been to a, some kind of fair down in middle Georgia and they had seen these bows and arrows and they were, they were little bows, little um, it, with the arrows, the tips of the arrows were erasers, right? And so they had bought a set, one for Ethan, one for Noah, who were still about this tall. 
and um, they come to the house and they'd, they'd gotten their presents. And, and uh, the next thing I knew, I was, I was standing at the window and, I, and everything in our house to that point had been, hey guys, listen, you got to protect your sister. Hey, boys protect girls. Boys protect girls. Just driving that in every day, every day. And, and I looked out the window and there was Abby and she had to be two, maybe three, maybe somewhere in the middle. And she's just, you know, toddling, going, doing her thing. And I see her go past the window. And then just after she's out of sight, here come the boys and they've got their bows and arrows. And they're just walking like this in the yard. Because we, had, we didn't have eagles, but we had these big vultures, right? And so our, my, my boys were there and they're, they're, they're covering their sister. They don't want some vulture to come down and take her up for a meal. And I was so proud of my boys. I was so proud of my boys. They watched her like a hawk. It was amazing. And I remember back to that scene in my front yard and I see this parallel. That we, we're supposed to cover one another. We're supposed to take care of one another. But in the context of the local church, it's not just males guarding females. It's everyone who names the name of Jesus caring for their brothers and sisters in Christ. And in everything, when it comes to our brothers and sisters in Christ, we're supposed to do it all in purity. Our motives need to be pure and our hands need to be clean. And just so you know, even pastors don't get to slide on this, okay? This Jesus' church, we show deference and respect to everyone. And this speaks to the way that we should view the family of God as if it were our own biological family to love one another at that level. And so the text continues in verse three and four. It says, honor widows who are truly widows. And we'll come back to that in a moment. But if a widow has children or grandchildren, let them first be the first to show godliness to their own household and to make some return to their parents, for this is pleasing in the sight of God. So <clears throat> honor widows who are truly widows. Now, what does that mean? What, what's the subtext Paul is laying down here? The fact of the matter is, some aren't in need, though they might claim to have a need. And the text is explicit. If a woman has lost her husband, but she has children and grandchildren, then the, the scriptures are explicit. Those relatives should shoulder the burden of caring for her. And that is what Christ calls us to do as family. Yes, she needs help, but she has that help within her own immediate family as a tacit acknowledgement of the provision that God's already given within that family. It's already there. Now, when a widow does not have immediate or extended family to live with and cannot care for her own needs, that's when the process kicks in related to the church. Or the other scenario is that if it's a young widow, she has the option to go back to her parents and also at some point later remarry if, if that's something she's led to do. But never forget, God designed the family as a matter of first priority. He didn't design it to break apart. He, he designed it to stay together. And unfortunately, that's not the way our culture is developed. And even I, even myself, at 50 years of age, I feel the deep loss of not being near to my parents. We're 2,700 miles away from my parents and, and, and Jen's mom. But to keep the family together in that day, generally speaking, was much easier because they were an agrarian society and they, they grew their own food. They, they just stayed in the same place for, for the most part. Um, and, and, and so we, we go on to verse five and we read this. She who is truly a widow, left all alone, has set her hope on God and continues in supplications and prayers night and day. But she who is self-indulgent is dead even while she lives. And Paul tells Timothy to command these things as well so that they 
may be without reproach. But if anyone does not provide for his or his relatives, and especially for the members of his own household, he's denied the faith and he's worse than an unbeliever. So <clears throat> what does it mean to truly be a widow in this context? It is to be left all alone after the death or the abandonment of a husband. And the word tells us that this woman, uh, that tells this woman to set her hope upon God and continue in supplications and continue in prayer night and day. She has the time to do that. And, and the Lord does not want us to be idle. Uh, being likely that she, she cannot work, and, and think, thinking back to their context in an agrarian society, right? She, she can't do all the work by herself. Being that she can't, she can't work physically to sustain herself at that level, she is instead to focus on the Lord and to focus on prayer. And the outpouring of her soul will be continual supplications both day and night. And the church needs that. All right? So, but some women, some women, even in the church, choose another way. And Paul, Paul addresses this as well. As she who is indulgent, he says, is dead already, even as she lives. So what that means is, Instead of serving others, that particular widow is seeking to be served all the time. This is not meant to minimize the loss of a husband at all. But, but for a woman, the loss of one's husband is frightening. It's regardless of the financial situation, right? I think about my mother-in-law and how she has navigated life since uh, Jen's dad passed away. It hasn't been easy, but God has been so close to her in her situation. And all of this because she is firmly rooted in a local church body. And they're taking good care of her needs. She's got the help that she needs. And the text tells us that the family is to shoulder the burden of responsibility as a matter of first priority. And then the church, if no one else is there to help, right? And Paul indicates that the widow ought to give the bulk of her time to prayer, specifically for the saints of God, those who are in the church and, and for needs that she's aware of in the church and in the community. And this is contrasted in the text in verse six with the self-indulgent widow who Paul says is already dead in a practical sense. She doesn't do anything to further the faith. So Paul's writing to Timothy and to us as recipients of the word to teach us these things in the church so that the body can continue in health and, and the body can continue to grow. And when we ignore these things, it inevitably fosters a bad attitude which suppresses the spirit in us and further combats against God's will and directives. So Paul tells Timothy, command these things so that the church may be without reproach so that nobody can look at the local church here and say, those guys don't even really love Jesus. Those guys don't obey the word of God, right? This, this is what Paul is saying. He, he's telling Timothy to command these things, right? And Paul makes sure that we get the point by his, his point by writing that if anybody doesn't even provide for their relatives, if you've got a widow, a grandmother, a mother, and you, it, they don't provide for their relatives, and especially for the members of their own household, those people have denied the faith and they're worse than an unbeliever. So Paul's point here rests on Romans 1 and natural law and the reality to which even the pagans are called to do this, right? So verse 9, it just, it just keeps rolling on here. Verse 9, let a widow be enrolled for the church to help take care of her, right? If she's not less than 60 years of age, having been the wife of one husband and having a reputation for good works. If she has brought up children, has shown hospitality, has washed the feet of the saints, have cared for the afflicted and have devoted herself to every good work. That's quite a list. So again, here's the list qualifications for a true widow. The first criterion is that she's not less than 60 years of age. She's been the wife of only one husband. She has a reputation for good works. She has brought up children. 
She has shown hospitality. She has washed the feet of the saints. In other words, she has cared for those in the church. She's cared for the afflicted. And she's devoted herself to every good work. So the specifications for a widow to receive care from the church were very strenuous, as we see. But her husband is gone, either by death or by sin, if he's abandoned her. There are a good deal that she wouldn't be able to do in an in a agrarian society to be able to provide for herself. So then the community around her needs to ask the question, what is she in need of? What does she need from us? And the answer is security. The need to know that there are people who love Jesus and who also love her, who are watching out for her, who are watching out for her phys physical needs, taking care of her. So she also, she also needs companions, companionship and friends, people to relate to, people to spend time with. Again, just thinking about my mother-in-law, um, when Storm Helene came through uh, Georgia, uh, she had a tree fall in her yard and by God's grace, it didn't hit the house. But within hours of the storm passing, again, people from her local church showed up. They cleaned up that tree. They sectioned it in and got it out. And it was, it, after a couple of hours, it was like it had never happened. It was just all gone. And I think that's a great illustration of just one of the ways the church needs to help widows and orphans and their affliction. Just things like that. Just popping in. Hey, how you doing? Can we just sit? I just want to visit with you for a little while. What do you need? How can we love you? Verse 11. Paul says to Timothy to refuse to enroll younger widows. And here's why. For when their passions draw them away from Christ, they desire to marry. And so they incur condemnation for having abandoned their former faith. Besides that, they learn to be idlers going from house to house and not only idlers, but gossips and busybodies saying what they should not. So he says, don't put a younger widow on that list. To, to do so would be to give them the freedom to seek their own pleasures rather than putting their efforts towards serving others. See, when you're in Christ, you serve others, not just yourself, not just going after what you want. Jesus wants us to take focus off of ourselves and put it back on him and put it back on the people around us. Jesus wants us to be aware of the needs around us. And that's very necessary because um, when those passions kick up, the, these widows, these young widows, they begin to wrestle with sexual, sensual desires, being young, and those desires draw them away from Christ. And in this context, they desire to remarry, and, and Paul says they incur condemnation because, excuse me, besides that, they learn to be idlers. They, they go from house to house and just talk and gossip and are busybodies and they say things that they shouldn't say. And, and so, so the question is, are they allowed to remarry or not? Well, let's see what the text says in 14 to 16. Paul says, so I would have, because of all this, because of the danger of all of this that we just talked about, he says, I would have, verse 14, younger widows marry, bear children, manage their households, and give the adversary no occasion for slander. For some have already strayed after Satan. If any believing woman has relatives who are widows, let her care for them. Let the church not be burdened so that many, so, uh, excuse me, so that so that it may care for those who are truly widows. So Paul, by the Holy Spirit, writes that he would have younger widows remarry, again, bear children, manage their house, and give no occasion for slander. And, and in this context, this is uh, after the husband has died, right? And so Paul warns the church here that some have already strayed after Satan. In other words, Satan has played on the, the fears of these women of not being cared for, and has played on their desires for sex and, and to have children. And if any woman has relatives who are widows, we, we are to care for them. Their, their family is to care for them as a first priority. And then the church comes in and helps with that. So the onus here in the text is placed uh, on the immediate and extended family of the widow. 
And Paul warns to avoid letting the church become overburdened so that it, it may care for those who are truly widows. And so, so then Paul, Paul now moves on to an another, to another issue. He says, um, verse 17 and 18, so let the elders who rule be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain and the laborer deserves his wages. I mean, it's this interesting picture of the ox and the, the, they had a big rock, a round rock in a trough, a round trough, and that ox would just go around and around and around, and whatever they were crushing to get the fruit of, whether it was uh, wheat or, or uh, olives or whatever it was, that, that, that ox could eat out of that trough while he was working, while that ox was working. So don't, the ox isn't going to work well after a while if you don't let him eat some of the thing that he's working with, Right? And so this is the point. Let the elders who rule be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. All of that, uh, all that God does is, is top down. Again, it comes from God to us. But that doesn't necessarily mean, as, as many errantly think, that because it's top down, that the recipients are of lesser worth. That would be a mistake. See, pastors are not better than non-pastors in God's sight. I want you to hear that. I'm not better than you. Pastors are not better than non-pastors in God's sight. Pastors are not necessarily more holy than some truck drivers I know. And that's not a knock on truck drivers. <laughs> it's not about your job. It's not about your position inside or outside the church. It's about fidelity to Jesus and staying in his word as a child of God. And that applies to the elders of the church as well as anybody else. But Paul points out that pastors, elders are worthy, worthy of double honor because of teaching and preaching the word to the saints. We're not, we're not better than anyone else in the church. We just have a different role and a different calling from God. I'm just your brother in Christ, right? So the scripture says, again, you shall not mu muzzle an ox when it's treading out the grain and the laborer deserves his wages. And, and this is pointing to the fact that despite some people insisting upon it, the pastors who give all their energy and time to the church should be paid and recompensed by the body of Christ. So obviously this idea of paying pastors and staff is legitimate, though there are, there are people who argue to the contrary. Um, now, is there an abuse of this in the American church? Yeah. Yeah. I've just been, the last couple of nights, watching a documentary about a church on the East Coast with a big name pastor. And millions of dollars, not a million dollars, millions of dollars coming into and through that mega, mega church. It's, it's, like, it's not just a mega church, it's a mega, mega church. I don't know if we start putting the little three after the end or the four, like how many multiples of mega it is. But I watched that two-part documentary with, with all the money and all the facilities that we don't have. And, and when it was over, when that thing ended, so glad to be the pastor of Emmaus Road Church in little old Stanwood, Washington. Because that place was a mess. And it's so easy to get caught up in the love of money. In, in, in something like that, caught up in other things that are not the gospel. I, I'm a, I'm, the truth is that until Jesus comes, there will be abuses of these things in the big C, big capital C church. But I want you to know there's none of that going on here in this little C church. We're just jazzed that we're still in existence and that God's speaking to us through his word, and that he's speaking over us, and that we're going forward by his grace. Amen? Verse 19, Paul tells Timothy, don't admit a charge against an elder except on the evidence of two or three witnesses. We are not to admit or even entertain an accusation or a charge of wrongdoing or sin against an elder or a pastor 
except by the evidence of two or three witnesses. And one reason for that is the role that he occupies, but also two or three witnesses had always been God's normative arrangement. If it's just one person, well, then it's impossible to ascertain the truth because it's that person's word against the other person. But if there are two or three witnesses, that accusation is either soundly established or dismissed. And so I thank God for his wisdom for the church. Verse 20. As for those who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all. I don't think I've ever done that at this church. I've seen it done. It's really, it's like everybody in the room's like, oh my goodness, you know. Somebody have to be called out. I haven't seen it happen very often. There have been many sit-down conversations with troublemakers, and in my tenure and full-time ministry, there have been some dismissals as well. Um, some people repent, and others double down on their sin. It's not something that any good pastor enjoys at all, but it is sometimes necessary. And this is to keep the local church healthy so that the sin doesn't spread to the rest of the congregation. If you've raised children, especially multiple children, then you know quite well of what I speak. When one gets in trouble and has to be corrected and punished, it is a deterrent to the others who witness it. It's a similar reality in the church. To be cut off from the life of the church was a big deal in the New Testament. In fact, it was a big deal until, oh, about the last smidge of the 20th century going into the 21st century. Now, when people are held accountable for sin in the church, they just go down the street to the next church. Being dismissed doesn't have the same impact today. There are churches on every corner in America, and not all of them are good. And just as an addendum, we cannot be excommunicated <laughs> because we're not Roman Catholic. Um, excommunication is the Roman Catholic Church's... Uh, proclivity, you would say, or their, their ability to damn a person to hell forever. As in their view, they are the only true church, right? So if you're put out, you're out, out, okay? In the, in the Roman Catholic Church. And, and in the Roman Catholic Church, the Eucharist, the, the, what we just did, we, we took the wafer, the cracker, and the, the juice, right? Um, in the Roman Catholic Church, the Eucharist is one of the means of salvation, right? Because it's a works-based salvation in the Roman Catholic Church. And so um, they, they, they're, not, they're not coming to Jesus by faith alone through grace, but they're coming by grace, some grace, and good works. And they're going to really need to read Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. In fact, I just wrote, I put a couple of verses here. If you have some Roman Catholic relatives or friends, ask me for this. I'd be happy to send you these. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 is by grace you've been saved through faith. It's not your own works. It's not your own doing. It's the gift of God. It's not a result of works so that no one's able to boast before the Lord. You just stand before the Lord and say, look what I did, God. I got here on my own. No, never going to happen. Titus 3, 5 says he saved us not because of the works that we've done by, by, that have been done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. We only got saved because the Holy Spirit came into us and made us new. Paul, Paul writing to the Galatians in chapter 2, verse 16, he says, yet we know that a person is not justified before God by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. Because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. And so Paul continues on here in 1 Timothy 5, verse 21. He says, so in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of the elect angels, I charge you, to keep these rules without 
pre-judging, doing nothing from partiality. So in the presence of God and Christ Jesus of the elect angels, I charge you to keep these rules without prejudging, doing nothing from partiality. That means the Holy Spirit seems, it seems like he's left out, but don't worry. He's already dwelling in, living in those who put their faith in Jesus. We're warned not to let ourselves become biased. This is, we can't get biased in the church, taking sides, um, judging because we, we like these people more than these people. It has to be judging rightly by the standard of God's word. And that's what he's encouraging us to. And then verse 22 and 23. Don't be hasty. I always go to Lord of the Rings. I, I don't know. Don't be hasty. Um, don't be hasty in the laying on, laying on of hands. Nor take part in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. No longer drink only water, but use a little wine for the sake of your stomach and your frequent ailments. Now remember, this is a letter from Paul to Timothy. Okay? So not all of this applies here or is for us expressly. Although you, you can drink wine if you want to. And you can drink water if you want to. Just, just so you know. Just so you know. Don't be hasty in the laying on of hands. So when we rush to appoint ministers and pastors and elders in the church, it is easy to overlook details. It is easy to overlook character traits that can come back to bite you in the end. And if and when they do, guess who's responsible for that? The one that appointed them. Having brought the candidate forth or by confirming that role, the ones who appointed share in the responsibility for the failings or sin, if that's the case, right? And we're told not to take any part in the sins of others, but to keep ourselves pure. And so the specific admonition from Paul to Timothy was about no longer just drinking only water, but to use a little wine for the sake of his stomach and his frequent ailments. And remember once more, that the water in that region at that time was not uh, generally as clean as our drinking water is today. So wine became the dominant beverage in that place. And just as it does today, um, so also when, when people are given over to drunkenness, right? But, but this, is, this is not a bad thing. He's asking Timothy to take a little wine because Timothy had an ailment too. And so... Uh, verse 24 and 25, as we start to wrap up here, the sins of some people are conspicuous. I mean, it's just right out there in public, right? Going before them to judgment, but the sins of others appear later. So also good works are conspicuous. And even those that are not cannot remain hidden. Whatever, whatever good things you do in the name of Jesus are going to come to light. And that's a good thing. But we don't have to shout it from the rooftops. God will do it for us if we stay humble. The sins of some people are conspicuous. The sins of others uh, appear later, but both are known by God because he sees all things and he knows all things. So also good works are conspicuous. In other words, what you do that is good, it's done in the name of Jesus, will not be hidden and he will judge us by our motives and all will be revealed on the day when we stand before him. So just to summarize this morning, we need to consistently be prioritizing the people around us who are in need. Since church resources are limited, it's important to focus on those who are the most vulnerable among us. And then with what we have left, we can encourage and build up other churches. We can build up other ministries. But here's the incredible news this morning. God's resources are limitless. Yeah. And so we need only ask, that doesn't mean that he's going to give us everything we want every time we ask him. It just means that when we have struggles, we have the opportunity to go to the God of the universe who is good and our father and who loves us. And in his economy, God calls us to prioritize those in need. He, he wants us to prioritize our biological family first. Our family members have primary responsibility to care for one another, the fatherless and those without mothers, God sees them. He wants us to meet their needs. 
as they cannot meet them for themselves. And if we're going to prioritize people who fall into those categories, we must war against laziness. We have to be intentional. And with the families in the church being cared for, once that's taken care of, then we can direct work and resources to the lost who are all around us. But this has to happen in order. We have to care for who's here. And then, and then we can care for more as God gives us more, right? So, so give generously. I haven't, I haven't asked that of you in a long time. Give, give generously of your talents, your treasure, your, your, your personal touch in the lives of other people. There are so many resources that the Lord wants us to utilize, but we need to be good stewards of what he puts in our hands and what we already have if we want to see the increase. Amen? So let's pray. Lord, we, we just ask you for that. We want to be good stewards of all that you entrust to us, whether it's people, uh, resources, whatever you send to us. We, we just thank you for the, the past several weeks. And um, I've been so encouraged here by what's happening, Lord. And so we just, we ask you to continue to do the things that only you can do. Give us wisdom. Impart wisdom to us. Put it in us. And give us the energy and the strength to go forward. We want to we wanna be with you. We want to honor you. We want your name to be glorious in our city, in our nation. Father, we, we just wait upon you to do these things. We receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. Here's the incredible news. God's resources are limitless. It doesn't mean that he gives us everything we want precisely when we want it. It just means that we have legitimate needs and struggles and we have the opportunity to go directly to him. He loves us. He wants to see his church grow. He wants to see the church flourish. The Mass Road Church, be faithful with what the Lord has given you. Amen.